Welcome to Life Along the Merrimack, the weekly podcast that focuses on the health and history of the Merrimack River. I am Dyke Hendrickson, a journalist, a writer, and outreach historian for the Custom House Maritime Museum. This half-hour presentation is heard on 96.3 FM radio and local Comcast cable TV. Segments are also seen on YouTube, and you can pick it up on SoundCloud. Frequently, we have guests. Not today. I will be reporting on several items. Now, about until a year ago, I was a reporter for the Daily News in Newburyport. I covered the waterfront and City Hall, so I'm familiar with river issues. In fact, I got interested in life along the Merrimack because um, it became known that the river is getting dirtier, not cleaner, and it's really a resource that um, we want to save. So that's why I come on here and bring attention to some elements of uh, the river and the history. Also, uh, my guests um, bring valuable information. I have written two books on the waterfront. One is called Nautical Newburyport. That's out um, in the public. In fact, I saw one at CVS the other day. I thought it was beautiful. And um, I have one coming out in March called New England Coast Guard Stories, at which time I went from northern Maine to southern Connecticut, interviewed Coasties, and integrated that with um, the history of uh, the Coast Guard. Now, Newburyport is the birthplace of the Coast Guard, so, you know, there's a connection there, and I'm looking forward to the book. I mean, <laughs> my frustration is I got everything in in early December. That means all the text, all the photos, all the captions. Uh, the cover was approved at that time. <laughs> so until last week, I hadn't even had a date for it. I mean, it's like 11 months, and we, they didn't get off the dime. But um, it appears it'll be out in March, so I'm happy. Today I want to talk about two issues. Um, they're, not, they're not tied to each other, but they're of interest to me and I think interest in mo most people. And one is how to clean up the river, and another is Newburyport women in history. When we talk about the Merrimack River, we know the river is getting dirtier, not cleaner. Um, Senator Diana DiZoglio uh, was on this show and explained why. And in brief, uh, sewer pipes carrying rainwater um, f are set to go into the sewage treatment plants in large communities like Haverhill, Lawrence, and Lowell. And when big storms go into the sewage treatment plants, the plant can't handle it along with the sewage. It overflows, and they have a discharge. These are called um, ex excessive... Um, effluent in the water, and um, it makes um, ports and areas downstream susceptible to fecal matter, to um, industrial waste, and that's one thing we're all trying to um, steer clear of. Uh, when heavy rains overwhelm the capacity of the treatment plants, they get raw sewage and rainwater coming out, and we've talked about that numerous times. These are called CSOs, Combined Sewage Outflows. So numerous fa state and federal workers have been looking into this. In fact, there is a body called the Merrimack River Regional Commission that just started in recent uh, weeks. Uh, many lay people, though, don't know exactly what the problem is, nor do they have an idea of how to fix it. So my first topic of conversation here is to provide a solution. Yes, thank you. I am providing a solution. And that is getting public officials and private citizens to press for funds from the Clean Water State Revolving Fund. And I'll say that again. The Clean Water State Revolving Fund. And that is uh, a fund, federal money, uh, is available, um, state or local communities get involved, they borrow money at a low interest rate, about 1.5%. And um, it's a situation where um, communities can start borrowing money to start improving you know, what they have. Um, because as we say, Haverhill, Lowell, Lawrence, Manchester, New Hampshire, they all have their sewer pipes going into the sewage treatment plants. It takes water as well as sewage, 
and they overflow. So this is a situation um, where we don't quite know what to do. Um, and I, I meet a lot of people, and you know they'll say, it's, you know, it's getting dirtier. Uh, what can we do? The Trump administration doesn't want to help. Um, but there is help out there, and this fund that I just mentioned is a fund um, that we all should know about. I'll repeat it a few more times, um, but it is a situation, it is a definitive answer. Um, and it's the Clean Water State Revolving Fund. And um, I believe Congresswoman Trahan of Lowell and uh, Seth Moulton here on the North Shore are looking into it. But if you ever need an explanation of, well, how can we make this better? How can we, you know, get more and better um, sewage apparatus in those large cities so the water doesn't go with the sewage, this is what you say. There's a fund out there, a federal fund, that state and local communities can access, and it's a start to uh, the problem here. But there is a lot to save here. I do feel that way. Um, I went to several events uh, here in the community recently. Uh, one was by the local Audubon Society down on Plum Island Turnpike, and they had a um, discussion with aerial slides of the marsh. Now, the marsh that we see in the Merrimack River um, is the largest in New England, and you know it goes all the way down to Delaware um, in terms of being the largest one. And they had aerial photos that looked at, you know, the Merrimack River uh, Basin, the Parker River, uh, Plum Island, um, behind Salisbury Beach. It was, um, you know, a glorious uh, a sighting of it because most of us <laughs> don't get into airplanes. And, um, uh, but you can see a lot. Of, you can see birds. You can see, uh, you know, fishermen going up some of the small bayous. They're not called bayous here, but pardon me. I used to work for the Times Picayune in Louisiana, and these words come out of me. But you know, it's a it's a beautiful sight, and that was inspiring to me. That look at these marshes, and we need to have a clean river so that'll keep working out. It is worth saving, and. Um, Another event I went to recently was uh, a photo um, exhibition by Glee Woodworth. Uh, she's a local historian. Um, she uh, got a hold of some of the best photos from the Snow Collection. This is uh, a former antique dealer here in town, gave his collection to the um, Museum of Old Newbury up on High Street, and so they called a lot of the best photos, and so that was interesting to look at. Most of the photos were from um, of, of inland. I mean, they'd have stores and neighborhoods and streets, and so some of the fun was um, trying to figure out, well, what street is this? What, you know, is taken in 1890? Um, what does it look like now? So that was very interesting and good. But there were also about eight or ten photos of the river, uh, which I enjoyed because I'm putting together a photo exhibition of the river for the Maritime Museum. And um, some of the things that I tend to forget, there used to be um, steamboats on the Merrimack River. Um, steam didn't really come here uh, as it did to some larger bodies of water. Um, but this was an example of uh, they would take people out on a Sunday and they would have hundreds of people on a steamboat. One was the city of Haverhill. So you could see the people, the women would get dressed up in their you know, full-length white dresses, summer cotton. Uh, the men would uh, be dressed up as well. And so you'd have um, you know, these wonderful steamboats out there. Also, it had photos of some of the last days of sh building the ships of sail here in Newburyport. Uh, the building of the ships of sail ended in about 1895. There were a couple in 1902, I think. But basically, the end of the 19th century meant the end of building ships of sail. But they were enormous. Some of them were almost 300 feet long. They weighed, you know, over 100 tons. Um, this is you know, enormous. Um, ships were built here. And when one was uh, ready to go out into the river, uh, school would be off, people would leave their stores, and it was quite an event. So there were some photos of the shipbuilding in the old days, 
There were some photos of um, fishing vessels. It was also mentioned that, new, that photography in America started in Newburyport in 1939, in 1839, I should say. And she showed some photos, which were very old, taken from the tops of several of the churches in town. And they looked over, over the town and towards the river. Again, this is 1839 and 1849, 1859, that type of thing. So I have never seen this documented that we were the first to have photography. I've heard it talked about frequently. Um, but we do know in the, popu- <clears throat> excuse me, in the popular mind, photography um, came to the public in the 1860s. Uh, Matthew Brady was one of the great uh, photographers during the Civil War. And he had uh, many, many photos that were brought back and eventually put into the newspapers. Uh, and this was very new. Uh, for all readers of newspapers. And it really was the first war, at least in America's history, that was brought home so graphically. You know, if you heard that, you know, 5,000 Yankees, good, you know, New England boys lost their lives at Antietam um, or at Bull Run, uh, in past wars, you you might not have um, been able to see what it looked like. But now, second Bull Run, for instance, there are quite a few photos from that that he and his um, assistants took. So America started seeing what the war looked like in, eight, in the 1860s. And Newburyport evidently had a very good um, start on that. We had some of the early photographers. And part of Gleed Woodworth's presentation was showing some of the photos from the old time. So that was interesting for me. And, um, you know, again, it, it makes it clear to me that the rivers were saving. And as I said, there is a you know, federal state um, program called the Clean Water State Revolving Fund. Uh, since, seven, since 1987, this fund has provided more than $133 billion to communities. Um, through, and it's low cost, about 1.5%. So communities and states can try to get this money. It also helps smaller communities. And one of the stats said that over this period of time, about $29 billion have gone to small communities. So we can think of New York and the Hudson River as a large community. Uh, Perhaps Haverhill on the Merrimack River would be a small community. But it does seem like there's money out there. Um, I would mention in the context of the river uh, Newburyport, Amesbury, and Salisbury do not send their stormwater through the treatment plants. I mean, that's a real benefit. Um, and I know Mayor Donna Holliday has frequently been frustrated because <clears throat> she and city fathers here in Newburyport spent extra money years ago to make sure that those were separated, that the stormwater did not go into the sewage treatment plant. But um, we are one of the few, at least on this part of the river, and as we say, Lowell and Lawrence and Manchester, Nashua, Haverhill, those are larger communities than we are. And they are the ones that um, are uh, sending effluent down the river. We are at the end of the line, of course. So that is what I say. If people ask you, well, what can be done um, in this period when the Environmental Protection Agency seems to be under duress, what you just say, as I am going to start saying in the future. Um, Well, there is a state federal fund that makes uh, money available at low interest um, to improve sewage treatment plants. So there it is. And uh, one of the things I think about when we talk about this administration, excuse me, might not be interested in pollution cleanup, I do remember uh, Ed Muskie in 1972. He was a senator from Maine. Of course, Maine has significant rivers, the Androscog and the Kennebec. Um, and they were under duress. Well, not under duress. They were much polluted in the 60s. And um, so was the Merrimack. So were many rivers around the country. But he was a key player. And he was able to generate the um, interest of other senators, of other states. And so uh, the Clean Water Act 
was passed in 1972. That was one of the biggest things that ever happened uh, to help pollution in rivers. And this did happen during the Nixon administration. Nixon's a Republican, of course. Muskie was a Democrat. Uh, people felt that Nixon would not uh, be in favor of this. This is 1972. Um, and he vetoed it. Richard Nixon vetoed the Clean Water Act. But there was enough political will on the other side, thanks to Ed Muskie and Ted Kennedy and some of these people, that the veto was overridden. So that's another small element I take out of this. Well, it might not be the time when we have an environmental president, but Richard Nixon was not an environmental president, and he even vetoed the Clean Water Act. But there was enough political will so that the act was approved. And um, I would mention that was 1972. Um, the city-state act that I'm talking about for cleaning up um, was passed in 1987. It was an amendment to the Clean Water Act, and that is um, the element that gives money to local communities. So there is money out there. Um, Congresswoman Trahan and Congressman... Seth Moulton are working on it, but in my mind, anyway, that is an area that many of the groups uh, can pursue, even if it's only a letter, even if it's only uh, support of something. Make sure it's known that um, you support this city-state plan to make federal money available so that communities can begin revamping their sewage treatment plans. So... Enough of my, uh, I don't know if this is a bully pulpit or not. It's a, it's a high chair, I will say that. But um, So that is one of the things I want to talk about. There is a solution to cleaning the river. Another thing that I've always been interested in is uh, women in Newburyport. Now, there are many books written about the history of Newburyport. And invariably, they're all about men. We have had four women mayors in Newburyport, um, Marianne Clancy, um, Donna Holliday, um, and several others. Um, but w women have not been talked about much in the history books. So that's why I kind of like to go into it. There are several women uh, highlighted in the book Nautical Newburyport. And I wanted to read a little about those women. Um, they, and there are also diaries of women. And I have a diary here I'd like to read a little bit about. So when we talk about women, there were a few women who went out, uh, and, and when I say women, women in the industry. In the 18th and 19th century, much of Newburyport's commerce was generated on the waterfronts. Uh, ships went sailing, and they, they took trade from here. They brought trade back, a great many merc mercantile items. Basically, no women meant went. There were just a couple. Elizabeth Bray went with her husband, Stephen Bray, in 1860, 1870. They were gone for three years. Um, that's unusual, though. Um, most women stayed home. And, you know, one of the things they had to learn was coping skills, because uh, hundreds of men were lost. If you're on a large ship going to India or to Honolulu, the ship would be lost, perhaps. And you never hear of them again. And so the mothers, the wives, um, the sisters, they would have to cope with that. Also, fishermen um, in this community were lost frequently. Now, the fishermen did not go as far. Some of them went on day trips uh, or a couple nights over. Or later, you know, in the mid-19th century, they'd go out to the Georges Banks, um, which were several days, if not more. Uh, but they were very vulnerable. They didn't have computer weather systems, of course, and um, many were lost. In fact, in the mid-19th century, there was something called the Yankee Gale, and um, it was about 1854, and hundreds and hundreds of boats from the North Shore went fishing. And by North Shore, I'm thinking, say, from Boston up to Portsmouth. And for this time, uh, 92 ships were lost in the, in the uh, Yankee Gale. And there are fishing boats with two to, say, six people. And 24, 92 ships from the North Shore were lost uh, in that one 
uh, storm. 24 of those vessels were from Newburyport. So at the least, there were two people in each one. So that's 48, and there are probably three or four. Probably, you know, on a given weekend, you would learn that 100 men and boys did not come back to Newburyport. I mean, to me, that's just remarkable. Um, the tragedy of it all, uh, the mourning, the coping that had to go on. So women were strong in those days. Um, and there's a very famous um, bust of uh, the situation in Gloucester, Mass. And, you know, they lost more people than we did because they had always more boats, especially in fishing. And there's a famous... Um, sculpture down there on the coast of Gloucester, a woman is holding her two children and looking out at the sea and waiting for their ship to come in with, with her husband and her, her two sons. And, of course, they've had um, nationally famous is a, um, a bust of a fishing captain um, at the, you know, guiding his ship. Um, he's in foul weather gear, <clears throat> And that depicts the fact that they got into big storms. And in this case, um, it was just well known that um, people would be lost. So some of the women that I think about, um, and you know, include Anna Jakes, who we know the name of Anna Jakes Medical Center. She was a woman uh, here in Newburyport. Um, she was unmarried, so she didn't have a family to leave it to. But in about 1881, she left uh, $22,000 to the local medical establishment for them to start a small hospital. Now, we, we all know that Anna Jake's Medical Center has grown enormously. It uh, employs close to 1,000 people now. It's the largest employer in Newburyport. But that was a woman who was really ahead, ahead of the pack on this one, that she thought her money could be well spent in a hospital. And so Anna Jakes is one of the great names. Emma Landa, Lander Andrews was another key person. She was an educator, a teacher, and she felt strongly that some of the less fortunate families should have books in their homes. So she started the South End Reading Room um, on Marlborough Street where youngsters could come in and uh, read books or perhaps take books out. And so this was, um, you know, very helpful uh, for place for the kids to go and to read because not every youngster got books in those days. It was quite a bit different. Um, so in 1905, a house at the corner of Purchase and Marlborough Streets uh, was obtained by the city and eventually became the Emma Andrews Library. And so we see that even today, that that exists because of Emma Andrews, who was a teacher, believed in education, started what was known as a reading room, and then it became a, a branch of the library. A couple other women who... Uh, were well-known in, in her own day. Jane Andrews, who, from 1833 to 1887, was an educator and an author. And she um, did a lot of things uh, for education here in the community. And she uh, wrote se a number of books, including The Seven Little Sisters Who Live on the Round Ball That Floats in the Air. <laughs> now, that's quite a long title, but titles can be strange even, even today. So... She had a girls' school at 188 High Street. She wrote books, and so she was a real advocate for uh, girls' education. I would mention there was a girls' high school here in Newburyport on Washington Street. It's the first one in the country, supposedly, where taxpayer money went to pay for girls' high school education. Now, girls could get educations elsewhere. Um, they could take French. They could take horseback riding. But Newburyport was the first to put tax money towards a girls' high school. That existed on, near Washington Street from 1844 till about 1866, when it was consolidated with a couple other schools in town, and in 1868 it burnt down. But there are a few wonderful photos of about 50 or 60 girls on the, on the front stoop. That's one of my favorite photos. Another woman, Minnie Atkinson, was very prominent, 1868 to 1958. She was a journalist and an author and wrote a text titled A History of the First Religious Society of Newburyport. 
And Atkinson um, was part of the Atkinson Coal and Lumber Company um, that some people remember from being right on the waterfront. I think Oldies is there now, but that used to be the Atkinson Lumber Company. Elizabeth Bray was a traveler that I had mentioned. She went out in 1854, boarded a ship with her husband, and uh, she was out for several years. Um, she left two boys on the dock, I mean, with her aunt and uncle, uh, but she took her five-year-old girl named Fanny, and Fanny was out there for two or three years with her parents. Um, she uh, ended up writing herself uh, about her adventures as a youngster on the high seas, and so the Bray family um, did have girls on the sea. Um, Hannah... Colby Fowle uh, lived from 1838 to 1929. She was a, uh, an entrepreneur, a businesswoman. She ran Fowle's News Center uh, at 17 State Street. Now, you can still see the Fowle's up on the wall there. Um, it's badly faded. <laughs> um, it used to be, like 15 or 20 years ago, the best place in town to get magazines and newspapers. Now, it's very hard to get magazines because it closed. It's been a restaurant. It's had three or four incarnations as a restaurant, I must say. But Hannah Colby Fowl was one of the first <clears throat> businesswomen here in town. And one of my favorites um, was Euphemia Vale Smith. She was a historian, lived from um, in the mid-19th century. In 1854, wrote a book called The History of Newburyport. It's a great uh, book, and uh, it still rings true. Harriet Prescott Spofford, 1835 to 1921, was a writer who um, of national prominence, and she her work was covered in the Atlantic Monthly and Harper's Bazaar, and she was, um, you know, very popular and wrote for the local paper as well. Um, Martha Wheelwright, um, was a philanthropist and longtime supporter of the Society for the Re Relief of Aged Females. And uh, her house is the old Wheeler House up on High Street, one of the biggest ones in town. So those are just a few of the women that have come to light. Uh, Glee Woodworth, the local historian, I must say, has been very good at highlighting these women. And they did a lot uh, in education, in writing, and... Um, they have a, you know, they put their own mark on our history, even if it wasn't going out to sea. In a couple minutes I have left to go, um, and maybe I can get back to this, because it interests me. There's a journal, um, Sarah Emery had a journal, and it was in about 18, oh, no, 1894, um, a journal from 1894 of Miss Sarah Emery's journal was recovered, it was translated, you know, from the hard copy. And um, it's an interesting, you know, her life as she lived it. She had several brothers and sisters. Um, but here's a couple of things that she used to do. I wish we had more time. Maybe I'll get to this early next week. Um, but, you know, they would travel. They would pick up people. They would um, have picnics. And, um, in fact, I think that's what I'll do. I think I'll read that another time because it is interesting. Like, okay, so if they didn't go on a ship, if they weren't, didn't have a hammer and anvil in their hand, what did they do? And um, so I think I'll get back to that another time. You know, I just want to stress that the Clean Water State Revolving Fund, I know I've said it before, I think is something that we all should be aware of. I mentioned that earlier. They have specific grants to help um, sewage treatment plants, and um, we really, you know, as I say to myself, because I go to many meetings and people here on the show, and from my reporting days, I still see people, and they say, well, what can actually be done? And I'm, <laughs> from now on, I'm saying, well, let me say this. The Clean Water State Revolving Fund is money that can be borrowed from the feds. It's a very low interest rate. We can start our improvements from that. And, um, you know, for me, that's going to be my go-to phrase. You know, do you know about this fund? Um, we have a couple state Congress people working on it, but they need a lot of wind behind them. And I think of Ed Muskie. You know, he he was. <clears throat> they battled him on the Clean Water Act in '72. Richard Nixon, in fact, um, vetoed it 
but it came through and helped a lot of people. So maybe this can too. I am Dyke Hendrickson. This is Life Along the Merrimack. We will be here next week. And thank you for joining me at this time. Goodbye.